Hello and welcome. Today I'd like to talk about communications and specifically, as you would have seen from the video title, we're going to talk about personal locator beacons. Now, we live in an amazing age for communications and it's probably only going to get better. Most of us on a daily basis would carry something like this around, a mobile phone of some description, um, the smartphones, I mean the capabilities of them is incredible. So we've got communications on hand all the time. When we're out in the wilderness situation, out in the bush, whatever, Quite often we won't have any service for those, you're, you're too far from a, um, a tower, so they're fairly useless in that kind of situation. Out there you might have something like a handheld uh, two-way radio, it's a little UHF citizen band, which is what we use here in Australia. Not bad, um, limited range, and there's no guarantee there's going to be anyone on the other end to listen to them, but they're good, particularly in a group for um, communications, and they can be of use in emergency. I also tend to carry, as a lot of people do, signalling mirror. Again, not a useful local device, uh, but again, you've got to have, you know, know where you're signalling to and then and find something useful, sure, but not the be all end all, and I'm not sure I want to bet my life on it. Fortunately, there's a solution, and that is something like this, which I've just picked up recently, and that's a personal locator beacon. And I'll just put it back in the box here to show you how this one arrives. It's kind of a combination box clamshell package kind of deal. What we're going to do is have a talk about this particular one that I've, um, I've made a decision to purchase and also we'll have a, a chat about the idea behind these in general and operational them and that type of thing. This will be, I guess, a product overview. It certainly isn't a review because to review a thing you need to use it and test it and by the very nature of these, if you turn them on, you're not testing them, it's activated and you're actually declaring emergency. So obviously we won't be doing that. So I'm just going to change the camera angle and uh, get it on the bench here. We'll have a look and uh, have a look. Have a bit of a chat about it all. Stay tuned. Okay, so what we have here is a GME brand, PLB. PLB is an acronym for Personal Locator Beacon. This particular one is the model MT410G, and it's GPS enabled. We'll talk more about that in a moment. It's a 406 megahertz beacon, which is the standard these days. Um, apparently, previously they were 121.5 megahertz. However, um, if someone offers you a second hand one that's in that uh, frequency, don't buy it because as of February 2009, the satellites that monitor these things no longer detect those beacons. So you must have a 406 megahertz beacon. This one does still transmit um, with the 406 megahertz. It also transmits 121.5. I believe that is for local um, search and rescue. They probably have um, radios or, or detection receivers which actually they use that for localised um, tracking you down. But that's after they've been notified from the satellite system. We'll just have a quick talk about the features of this particular model and why I chose it. I did a bit of research on these before I, um, I, I put my money down and worked out that this was apparently one of the, uh, the best ones around. They're all obviously got to meet the minimum standards. One of the other reasons I chose this one um, is also that it's designed and manufactured right here in Australia, uh, which sort of gives me a warm and fuzzy feeling because we don't do a lot of design and manufacture in this country anymore. So um, it's rather nice to know that there's a company that's, that's doing that and they're actually exporting these to very many countries in the world. You may in fact be able to um, get this in your country. Before we get into it, in the box, besides obviously the unit itself, there's this bit of paper which is a declaration of conformity, which is, I guess, saying that it, it meets the, the standards. And in all these countries, which I'll very, very quickly scroll past, now it's quite possible that if you're in any one of those countries listed, you can actually buy this same unit. Also here in Australia, there was a couple of these registration documents because you do need to register your unit with your local rescue service. I didn't use those, I registered online, and we'll talk more about that later. And of course, it comes with a very comprehensive instruction and manual owner's guide, whatever you'd like to call it, um, which is very, very good, full of useful information, not just about the unit itself, but also about registration and, and that type of thing. So, really well done on that one. This particular unit, it's very light. I haven't weighed it, but it doesn't, doesn't weigh an awful lot. Um, Size-wise, I didn't measure it either, but um, you can tell it fits in the palm of your hand there. It's quite thin, narrow, etc. So it's something you can carry around a bag, pack, whatever, and it's, it's not really going to weigh you down. It's fitted with a non-user serviceable, non-hazmat battery. Now, the reason that's important is that you should be able to carry this as a passenger on a commercial aircraft or anything like that because it's not hazardous material. They do recommend, however, that you check with your, your carry before I'm actually taking this on board in cabin luggage. The battery in this one has a seven year service life, which means they warranty it out to seven years. At that point, you should either replace the unit or you can send it in for service and have the battery replaced. 
up until that time it's um, certified that it will, if activated in emergency, run for 24 hours continuous. As mentioned, this particular unit, as many of them are now, is GPS enabled. You can see that quite clearly up on the top there, on that little dome which holds our strobe light or conceals our strobe light. Now the advantage of GPS is when you trigger this thing, it not only sends out the signal to, um, to the satellite, but it sends up some data. Now amongst the data it sends is this unit's particular number, which is on that sticker. I'm not going to show it completely or on that side of the case. They have a what's called a UIN number. You can just see that under my thumb there. And that's a, a code that is particular to this one unit. So because I registered it and my local um, authority knows my name, etc., contact, phone number, that type of thing, they can quickly ascertain that the signal's coming from me and they could phone me to check that it's not a, um, an accidental dental activation or something like that. And there's also facility on the um, registration to say list your vehicles, uh, boats, aircraft, what have you. But as I say, it transmits in addition, once it's established for the GPS at the same position, it'll transmit your GPS coordinates up to the satellite, and which is then relayed to the nearest emergency services. So they'll get a very accurate fix on you. If anyone's thinking of buying a beacon, I strongly recommend going to GPS enabled. It's only a few more dollars and the accuracy is much better. Now, according to the Australian Maritime Safety Authority website, which is our um, authority here in Australia where we register these things and who coordinate all national rescues, a GPS device such as this, you can expect an accuracy of around about 120 metres or less. So in other words, the area they're going to come looking for you is going to be an awful lot less and they'll find you faster. A non-GPS PLB, 5 kilometre radius. So it's a significant difference. All right. Back to this unit, 50 channel GPS receiver we've talked about, which is really good. It's completely waterproof, it's sealed. As mentioned, it's not user serviceable, so don't go trying to take it apart. And it's also, as well as being waterproof, it's buoyant, so it will, if dropped in the water, float. However, unlike an EPIRB, which it's, it's a relative of, but it's not an EPIRB, it won't float with the antenna up unsupported. So if you're in a maritime environment, if you're going out on a boat, having one of these is not a substitute for an EPIRB, at least under Australian regulations. If you were in a water environment, you'd have to physically hold this thing so the antenna was clear of the water for it to transmit correctly. It's got a, um, in addition to the signalling, when you set this off, there's a high intensity LED light in there which flashes, which is obviously going to be good for them to find you if it's night time. Output on these is 5 watt, which I believe is a standard for any PLBs or EPIRBs, so that's your output power, and obviously that's enough to um, get to the satellite. I mentioned that you need to register these, and Every country is going to have its local authority. In Australia, as mentioned, it's AMSA, or the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. I registered mine online rather than through the snail mail, and it's really quick and easy. And that's, there's a sticker on the box here, it tells you where you can go to do that. amsa.gov.au forward slash beacons. Took me probably 10 minutes because I'm not the world's fastest typer. But then you're good to go, and you can update that if you're going on a particular trip or journey or trek on a day. You could log on to that site, say the day or the night before, and put those details in. In the event you activate this, the people at the Coordination Centre are going to access that page and look at what you've put on there. So really important to register it. In fact, it's compulsory to register it. So what we've got here, have a quick look at the unit. I don't really want to um, show those numbers off, but what I will show here is a seven-year battery life stamped permanently into the side of the case in there. You'll see the replacement battery date, which this one is May 2021. On the bottom there, a little bit of information about who made it. Nice bright yellow so you can see it. It's got some more information on the side there. The antenna latch up the top, we'll talk about in a moment. Comes with a lanyard, so you can hang it around your neck if you need to. Although when you activate it really, you're best to have it in one spot, and preferably on, on a top of a rise or a hill or some sort of height, and that's going to get better satellite reception. Stand it up vertically, deploy the antenna, and away you go. Before we get into how it works, there's a test function on this, and if you look at the back there, you'll see a little slot. Now on the lanyard, there's this tool included, and what you do to test it, and you can, I don't know if you'll pick up on the camera, but you'll see there's a word test there in order to arrow, you put the tool into that slot and pull it down. Now what's going to happen, I'll do this for you, you shouldn't do this too often because it will obviously use battery power. They say no more than once a month. I don't think it's necessary to do it that much, but what we'll do is I'm going to pull that down, and then you'll see the strobe light in here will flash and the unit will beep and that indicates that the circuitry is all working and the battery is still fine. There you go, that's all you need to do to show that it's working. There is another test you can do which will actually 
get the unit to locate a, GP, a uh, GPS satellites and everything takes a few minutes and it will burn more battery power. So really I don't think that's necessary. The last thing you want to do is go burning your battery up to testing this thing. You need it for an emergency. Alright, now to use it, on the back here there's some very good instructions so you could give this to anyone and be able to use it. You'll also note there's a security seal across here which should remain unbroken. You shouldn't be tamping with that. That'll break in the event this is actually activated. What happens is down the bottom here you press in the antenna release button. At that stage that'll break those two seals. This plastic section will swing up and you can just see here this is also part of the antenna. It coils around here and back down and that's actually the end of the antenna just there. So when it's deployed you'll have that plastic rod and then the metal hanging off it. So you click that, push it up, make sure it gets upright, assist it if it needs to and it'll latch into that antenna latch there. And basically what happens then, the unit will beep. Now it doesn't actually transmit for 60 seconds and the reason it waits 60 seconds is if it accidentally activates or if you've accidentally activated it, it gives you time to deactivate the unit before obviously having a false alarm situation. So 60 seconds, you have that delay there. Alright, if you need to deactivate it, after the antenna's up, let's say it's, you've accidentally done it, or more likely, if you've used this thing in, a, in anger, in a real situation, you always leave it on until you're rescued. They, they use this to home in on you, so don't just activate it and turn it off. If you're in an emergency and you desperately need to use this, leave it on. I should stress, this is last ditch stuff. This is really threat to life, imminent danger, and you have no other option. So that's when you use it. But to deactivate it, again, you would use this tool, and it goes in that little hole there, which will then allow you to lower the antenna, and you can wrap that coil back away, and that deactivates the unit. If you go and dispose of one of these in its life, it's very important, and there are detailed instructions in the manual about removing the battery and getting rid of it um, without the power source in it. Apparently one of the great sources of false alarms on this type of device is people just throw their old ones away in the dump or something with the battery still in them, and they get activated, and next thing you know, they've, they've got a false alarm. And really, we, you don't need that. Okay, that's valuable resources that could be uh, should be on standby for a real rescue. So it's important to avoid false alarms. Now, it comes with this carry case. It's got a, a belt loop on it, which I don't intend to use. It's a neoprene type case. And it's also a great idea to keep it all the time because it'll help prevent false alarms. Because when it's in there, there's no way that that can release accidentally. If you just had this bounce around your pack, potentially it could get knocked. Next thing you know, you're hearing beeping from your backpack and you've got a false alarm. So it fits in there quite firmly, it's, which is what you want. Just stuff the lanyard down in the back of it there. Like so. And you put that over, and that's how it gets carried around in my pack, or if it's in your car, or whatever you're doing. I highly recommend keeping it in there, because it's going to prevent you having those activation problems. Quite a decent quality little bag for what it is. Now, I'd thought about buying one of these for a long time and I'd sort of put it off and put it off. Um, they're not cheap, but at the same time they're not really overly expensive. Um, I just paid for this one recently $295, which was I think about 50 bucks off the normal retail from uh, people I buy my GPS device and things off. And I will put a link down below for my Australian viewers because if you can't get one of these locally, they go, these guys do have them online. They're reputable and they'll be able to ship one across to you should you decide to get one. And no, I don't work for them, I'm not associated with them, but I've had good service. So if you can't get one locally, yeah, check that out. Um, as I say, it cost me $295, which I guess in some ways is an awful lot of money for something that you hope never to have to actually use and switch on. But then a lot of us will pay more than that for, say, a pack, a tent, a pair of hiking boots. And I think, you know, if you find yourself in a dire situation um, where, you, where your life's probably in danger, suddenly that $295 or $300, whatever money you've spent on this PLB is going to seem like pretty damn good value, pretty cheap. You, you, uh, you'd be happy to have spent it. So that's it, um, guys. It's a good option. It's a, it's a safety net. It's like having insurance on your car or your house. You hope never to actually have to claim on it, but you always have it anyway. So for those of us who get out and about in the wilderness a bit, I think these are a good investment. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. Bye for now.